With so much that's going on in the world just this weekend with a uh, tragedy of a, a little three-year-old that many of us knew, his parents passing away last night, the shootings. On your notes, we're adding a third page that's going to be a little bit longer in the future. The Sermon to Life section is what I've been calling it. I'm adding a, something below that. How can I say yes to today's message? And we're urging small groups, if possible, the elder team is urging small groups uh, to take a look at the sermon and look at the outlines and see if there's a place we can dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, do this in your devotion time. Luann will actually be teaching her Wednesday night class a, a deeper dive into the sermon. As we open this morning, I want you to look at the third page, and I'm referencing this book, The Celebration of Discipline. We're looking at celebration today, this book by Foster, where, where I write, as part of your take-home, how can I say yes? I say, get a copy of Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth, and I've got a copy you could borrow. But, but I want to read this in context of all that's going on, good, bad, and ugly, in our world today. A popular teaching today instructs us to praise God for the various difficulties that come into our lives, asserting that there is a great transforming power in thus praising God. In its best form, such teaching is a way of encouraging us to look up the road a bit through the eyes of faith and see what will be. This is in the chapter of Foster's book, The Celebration, The Practice of Discipline. It affirms in our hearts the joyful assurance that God takes all things and works them for good to the those who love him. In its worst form, this teaching denies the vileness of evil and baptizes the most horrible tragedies as the will of God. Because there is a balance and there is a lesson to this idea of the celebration of discipline. In its worst form, this teaching denies the vileness of evil and baptizes the most horrible tragedies as the will of God. Scripture commands us to live in a spirit of thanksgiving in the midst of all situations. It does not command us to celebrate the presence of evil or the actions of evil. Now, it's not in your notes, but I, but I could have put it there, but I didn't do it intentionally. Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul wrote this, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. The message says celebrate God every day in every way. And then Peter went on to say, I mean revile him, excuse me, <laughs> I mean <laughs> reveal, revile him, right? Revel in, revel in him, revel in him. Start the tape now. Okay, revel in him all the, the time. But if I would open that way, then you would have thought I'm talking about religious things. And somehow this morning in this celebration, uh, this practice of celebration, we've got to get beyond the religious aspect of it. It's, it's religious, it's spiritual, it's in the scriptures, but we've got to go past it and understand that all of life, all of life is sacred. And it's okay to celebrate little things. It's okay to celebrate big things. It's okay, as I mentioned in the notes, it's okay to celebrate when your kid gets a hit. For some of us, it's okay when your kid just gets in the game. It's okay to celebrate a really good meal. It's all right to celebrate a brand new outfit. It really, truly is. In the spiritual practice of discipline, this book by Foster, Richard Foster begins his chapter on the spiritual practice of celebration with this. It's in your notes. Celebration is at the heart of the way of Christ. Festivity ought to be a hallmark of the Christian faith. Continuing on, what an attraction celebration can be to those unfamiliar with the Christian faith. I'm going to read a letter from 130 A.D. It's titled, Mathetes to Diogenetus. And we, there was only one copy they found somewhere. It's now been lost. Multiple copies were made before the original was burnt in a fire. But I want you to hear what this letter says. We don't exactly know. Mathetes simply means disciple. There was a, a man in Caesar's court by this name of Diakonetus. We don't know whether that was going to him or not. But listen to what he says. Christians are said to dress and eat like everyone else in the empire. Yet, there is something extraordinary about their lives. I'm suggesting that celebration can be a testimony to those unfamiliar with this faith that we claim. They have so little and celebrate so often. 130 AD. 
They live as citizens but take on the disabilities of aliens. Maybe a lesson to us about this immigration crisis that we have. They live as citizens but take on the disabilities of aliens. They have children but they do not abort them. They marry but they do not share wives. It's in the letter. They love all and are persecuted for it. They choose poverty but enrich many. They bless even when attacked. Their candles, their lamps never, ever seem to go out. Did you get a candle? Did you get a candle? Many of you still have the puzzle pieces that I gave you several years ago in your Bibles. You've shown them to me. Pastor, here's my puzzle piece. Remember I said you, you, your, your life fits. It may not look like it, but your life fits. And every piece of your life fits, though the puzzle may be incomplete. This will fit in your Bibles, too. I don't know how you get it in your phone. But I want you to stick this in your Bibles to remind you to celebrate. And as we go through this message this morning, I, I, I just hope that as you find this, oh yeah, remember that sermon, and I've not celebrated for a while, I need to celebrate, that candle reminds me, and honestly, you can keep it in there, and you'll hardly even notice, because you've got your puzzle pieces in there, at least many of you do. Think of the contrast that our celebration can have to, to this dulling melancholy that's in our culture right now. The, the rage that's in our culture right now. This apathy that seems to be existing. What a contrast. What a contrast it can be. He said, they have so little and they celebrate so often. Now there's ironies to celebrating. And originally, in fact, if I had copies to the uh, tech team, they would see the picture of Andy Rooney. Anybody know who Andy Rooney was? The curmudgeon from 60 Minutes. He could make everything ironic. The good and the bad of America, he could make ironic. But I thought, you know, some of you won't know who Andy Rooney was. You'd think he was George Clooney or, you know, Mickey Rooney. So I took that out and put this up here. But here's the ironies. Here are the ironies of celebrating. There are those who celebrate all the time. They, they never say no to themselves. They do all that they can do to keep themselves happy. And the survey says... Those people are the most unhappy people in the world. That's the irony of it. And then there are those, and I'm thinking of Luke 10. It's in your notes. Then there are the Marthas. She's in the kitchen, and she's making a lot of noise with those plates and all of those glasses, right? While her sister Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus in the living room. And Martha's intentionally making noise to make sure everybody knows that she's in there working. But the party, the party's in the living room. And so these Marthas are those that, that do a lot, they produce a lot, but they always miss the party. Looking in your notes, the ad irony of these seemingly successful people is that they do many things, but they miss the best moments. Then there are those who wait to celebrate. They work hard too. But they say no to some things so they can say yes to better things later. The irony of people that wait to celebrate is that they have a higher sense of purpose, are happier, and have healthy relationships. Their celebrations are genuine and they're transformative. And when we're looking at the spiritual practice of celebration, we're talking about celebrations that are formative. We're talking about celebrations that are a means to a discipleship in. And in that context, as we look at celebration that way, they're transforming us. They're transforming you, and they're transforming those around you. They're transforming your relationships. These people that celebrate properly are healthier and happier, even though they often have to wait to celebrate. So moving on with our notes. I mean, seriously. was cause for celebration I'm just looking in my notes it was cause for celebration when Jesus is born what did the angels say behold I bring you good news which will be for all people that's the word gospel there we're gonna begin a series in two weeks what's so good about the good news what's so good about the good news is the Savior's been born and I'm glad we sang about the resurrection day if you go through the book of Acts, that's what they preached all of the time. The resurrection made all of the difference. I, behold, I bring you good news, which will be for all peoples. 
And what's not to celebrate? What's not to celebrate? A Savior who, the first public sermon after his temptation, it looks like Jesus went to the synagogue often, and it doesn't look like this was the first time he'd been asked to unroll a scroll and read from it. But it says in the book of Luke, he opened the scroll and he went down, which would not be easy if you've ever looked at a Jewish scroll because there's no... Chapters and verses, so it involves some rolling and unrolling. What's he going to read? What's he going to read? He goes to the book of Isaiah, and he proclaims the acceptable year of the Lord. We've not looked in our Bibles yet this morning. Please turn with me, if you would, to the book of Leviticus. We're talking about the year of Jubilee. You know what the Jubilee is in Hebrew? It's Yobel. It's the word ram's horn. The year of the ram's horn. You and I know the ram's horn is the shofar. Jesus announced the year of the trumpet blowing. That's how he introduced his ministry. What is not to celebrate about that? And, you know, in your notes and in the bulletin, if you read that, I, I got thinking about communion. I get the solemnity of communion. I get the idea of self-examination. I get the idea, you know, an, an unexamined life is a life not worth living. Remember I said that in another sermon? But Paul called it a feast. And he says, let us therefore keep the feast. And I said, you know, if you can't dance about communion, at least smile a little bit. Your sins have been forgiven. Right? Look in the book of Leviticus, verse 20, uh, chapter 25. It's the third book in the Old Testament. So it's, uh, it's Genesis, Exodus, and then uh, uh, Numbers, Leviticus. It says in verse 13, in this year of Jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. When you had a bad debt, you lost that property. That debt was paid with your property, and, and you lost your inheritance. But every 50 years, every group of seven years, seven times seven, in that 50th year, everything that had been lost, whether through the poverty of, of a famine, the poverty of a bad investment, was returned back to you. The year of shofar, the year of jubilee, the, the year of return, the year of release. Everything that you had lost is returned to you. And Jesus said, I come to proclaim the perpetual, the year of jubilee, the year of release, the year of forgiveness, the year when things lost by coincidence, your bad choices, famine, the weather, it all comes back to you. What's not to celebrate? And it's really cool. It is totally all-encompassing this year of Jubilee. Look at the last two verses in Leviticus 25. Somebody's shoes are going to just blow off at some point in this sermon. Or if not, you're simply not listening. Even if someone is not redeemed by any of these ways, and it's a long list of ways that people are redeemed. And so the Holy Ghost is saying through Moses as he's writing this, even, okay, so I've given you all these ways to release people, but if somehow I missed anything, read what it says. Even if someone is not redeemed in any of these ways and their children are to be released, it's the year of Jubilee. Why? Because the Israelites belong to me. You're inescapably his. Inescapably his. There, there, there's no escaping the fact you are his. And he says, I want them returned to year of jubilee what's not to celebrate jesus taught the things he did so that his joy might be in us hebrews 12 for the joy set before him he endured the cross despising its shame and jesus said this he did these things he taught these things so that his joy might be in us and that our joy may be complete i.e. The angel introduced him as good news, and then he bequeaths joy to us. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. Blow the trumpet in Zion. It's the year of Jubilee. I, I, I probably got some pretty good ideas why some people don't want anything to do with Jesus because of the way we portray him. We're talking about a Savior whose first miracle was turning water into wine. Did Billy, Billy Graham should have given that invitation. <laughs> a Savior whose salvation is a celebration. You better give your heart to Jesus. 
Well, that's not how Jesus approached it. Jesus knew how to celebrate. And he want, the joy that he had, he wanted to bequeath to us. Now, we're talking about celebration as a spiritual practice. Viewing celebration as a spiritual practice puts celebration into the category of thoughtful preparation. Okay, we're, because it's a discipline, it's a practice. It, it, so we're, 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 we're not just talking about the birthday parties, though that's part of it. We're not just talking about the anniversaries. That's part of it because not every family celebrates those things very, very well. And, and we should take advantage of all these natural opportunities, Easter and Christmas and, and New Year's and Fourth of July. Take advantage of all those things. Thanksgiving, of course, take advantage of those. But we're talking about celebration as a spiritual practice. Great parties take planning. In other words, celebration, like all the other spiritual practices, require discipline. And, and we've avoided using the word discipline a lot in this series, but we need to insert this word discipline and understand something. Discipline may be difficult, but it's the devil's lie. It is the devil's lie to think that discipline makes things less fun. The most disciplined people are the ones who have the most fun. As long as they keep that discipline in perspective. And they see that discipline as a means to an end. Discipline may be difficult, but it's the devil's lie to think that discipline makes things less fun. Discipline improves everything. I love the fact that girls are getting to play ball now. And I was talking to a young lady last spring. She had a really, really tough May at Lawrence High in softball got into a slump. Some of you have played ball before. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, she was a great hitter, but she just wasn't hitting well. And, and I'm not sure how far Lawrence High went in the girls' state softball tournament, but then she joined her traveling team. She's going to be a senior this, 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 this year, last year, I guess it would have been. And she says, I, I was pretty sure I wouldn't even get to play because not only was it going to be folks from Lawrence High, it was going to be girls from Free State and some girls from Johnson County, and I was in a slump. I didn't get any hits. You know what the coach did? Pulled her aside and said, you're going you're to hit your way through this slump. You know what I'm talking about? You ever played baseball? A, a good coach understands it. She says, I know you can be a hitter. You're going to work your way out of this slump. It's going to require some discipline. But don't ever think that this, and she did. She had a great summer last summer playing ball. Celebration as a spiritual practice is a consciously chosen way of thinking and living. The decision to celebrate will lift you above all circumstances. Now we can say Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Celebrate God every day in every way. Revel in Him. I mean revel in Him, it says in the message the decision to celebrate will lift you above your circumstances. In choosing to celebrate, you and your relationships will be transformed. And that's the purpose of the spiritual practices. We're talking about the spiritual practice of celebration as a means to a discipleship end. Celebration is a, as a spiritual discipline means that we should also be on the alert for God's surprises. This is a different kind. This is the celebration that you plan, that you intentionally think. I, 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 uh, sometimes it's a, it's a tough day, and, and, but driving home, I get to start at Daisy Hill and go south down Iowa. I don't know what that view is looking south from Daisy Hill, south from Lawrence, but I celebrate my town every time I see that view. You know what I'm talking about? I, so yeah, we celebrate our town every time I see that view. It's a conscious decision because there's many things about this town that grieve my heart to the nth degree. But I, I see this view, and I'm at the one of the highest points in this town. I just celebrate the fact, God, you brought me here. This is your town This for your purposes. And I just choose to celebrate my city at that moment looking south because it's a beautiful view. Be on the lookout for times when Jesus is bringing the celebration to you. And in this busy world, it is really easy to go from place to place, to thing to thing, and miss these moments because God orchestrates them. And this is the discipline, the discipline, being on the alert. Have your celebration antennas. Remember my friend Martian? Looking for something to celebrate, just looking around, something to celebrate. Amen. Keep your eyes open. C.S. Lewis called them jabs of joy. 
uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody said, Pastor, what were you doing? Oh, no. <laughs> Remember the movie, I Know Who You Are, and I Saw What You Did? Remember that line, that freaky movie? We saw the drive-in. scared me to death. Okay, okay, don't text anymore. Some of you have actually seen me pull over and text, and that's a good thing. But what was I doing? What was I doing? And then they said, well, it was, I go, you know, kind of nervous because I, I didn't want, think anybody knew I robbed that bank. And I, 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 I said, well, it's Thursday afternoon. It's about 5.30. I, I knew exactly. I was just listening to that song, Fear is a Liar. You know that song? And I, I just got in, you know, got in, in, came into my car, and I just threw up my arms and forgot to steer. But hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Fear, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. And I'm just having this mini celebration on that song, and one of you saw me do it. You know what they said? It looked like, it looked like one of the royals had hit a home run. I said, well, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> But fear is a liar, and that was worth celebrating. Because here's the thing. There are times when you're too tired, and you're way too busy, and too broken to celebrate. And so God brings the celebration to you. He brings the party to you. You ever done that? Gone to the hospital room and had a party, took the birthday party to the hospital room? Uh, take the birthday party to, to the hospice center, to the nursing home. C.S. Lewis called these unexpected intrusions jabs of joy. An encouraging thought enters your mind. Against your own will sometimes, an encouraging thought enters your mind. A warm conversation, a kind smile. A photo or a piece of art. Something seen while driving the car. I, I delight at, you know, it's not my yard, but I delight at beautifully landscaped yards. I love coming down Bob Billings and seeing the sprinklers on the golf course. And I just celebrate life. And all the time this happens, music on the radio. All the time. All the time. All the time. So we get what we celebrate, first point. We get what we celebrate. Hear this carefully. If you need more <laughs> salvation, celebrate what you got. Now, I'm not talking theologically, because if you're saved, you are saved. I'm talking about experientially. If, you, if you're saved but you don't feel very saved, celebrate that little feeling that you've got. Seriously. If, if I think we all have a measure of the Spirit. The Bible says, filled be ye filled. If you want more Holy Ghost, celebrate what little you got. And you'll find out rivers of living water just begin to flow. It, it, there's, it untaps. I'm not speaking theologically. I'm speaking experientially. It's, it's related. That's why we celebrate. Celebrate begets more celebrating. What I have noticed is joy is its own multiplier. It's just its own multiplier. One guy starts laughing. I mean, I, 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 I love watching John Chris, the Christian comedian. And before he starts talking, he's laughing. And so I start laughing. He hasn't even told a joke yet. Right? Joy is its own multiplier. But, but take a, t think about this. Maybe you know this story. We won't turn there. Nehemiah 8. So Ezra's reading, well, not much of the Bible. Basically just Genesis to Deuteronomy. And everybody's there, young and old, it says. And they have not looked in the spiritual mirror for a long time. And everything that Moses is reading, Genesis to Deuteronomy, there's a lot of stuff they had hardly been doing. I mean, they hadn't looked at a spiritual mirror for who knows how long, and they get into a national funk. Ne Nehemiah chapter 8. And guess what Nehemiah says? Follow with me. It's in your notes, third paragraph. Nehemiah countered their collective woe by saying this go home celebrate <laughs> go home enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing they he knows what they're going to be dealing with now this is going to be a long road back home to restoration they've been in spiritual rebellion and they know it and they feel the woe of it and the emphasize you need to go home and celebrate 
This is from the Holy Spirit, inspired by God, telling us this. Go home, enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. That's wine, by the way. And send some to those who have nothing. If there's, your neighbor doesn't have what you've got, you need to prepare something for them too. This day is holy to our Lord. Oh, it's holy to our Lord. Oh. This day is holy to the Lord, so don't grieve. The joy, this phrase, this quote that you quote all the time, the joy of the Lord is our strength, that's where it came from. That's the context. The joy of the Lord will give you the strength to go on from here. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. Cause to celebrate. Cause to blow the shofar. It's the year of Jubilee. And if, and if there's something I missed, I just want you to know everybody's free. They're mine. Come back to me. <laughs> joy is its own multiplier. Joy and strength are companions. More joy, more strength. More strength, more joy. It's in the Bible, Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps forward. Do you see the relationship, the companionship between strength and joy? <laughs> the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. He helps me. My heart leaps forward, joy, and my song, with my song, I will praise him. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and strength and joy are companions. The more joy, the more strength. The more strength, the more joy. We get what we celebrate. And then number two, our celebrations demonstrate what we value. Oh, really? Yeah. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. I'm looking at Acts 5.41, just going through my notes. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. By the way, they had been whipped. They had been flogged. The apostles. Celebrations demonstrate what we value. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering. Disgrace for the name. What's that singing coming from the prison? Oh, those are those two nuts, Paul and Silas. Right? They're singing and praising. And when they praised, the prison doors were open. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If you've never seen this scene, you've got to rent the Matthew Bible, the visual Bible, and watch the book of Acts 1. It shows this beautiful story where Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch, and if you know the story, he baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the Bible says Philip was, and then was no more. He got just, trans, just moved someplace else, and the Ethiopian comes out of the water, and Philip is gone, and this large, black Ethiopian man, he's a eunuch, just starts celebrating in the video. It's powerful. It's the book of Acts visual Bible. The Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Why? Acts 8, 39, because he had found salvation. The context was he's reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, huh? Watching your celebrations, what would outsiders say you value? Now, I hear this question. This question should not be taken to infer that your celebrations have to be religious. I opened very differently from that, didn't I? But we've got to know this. To do it that way, that'd be legalism. And that's not what I'm talking about. Treat all of living as sacred. It's okay to cheer your kid's big hit. A new job, a new outfit. Even a, even a full string or a fish. Seriously. But it's important for us to understand that our celebrations do also reveal our treasures. Jesus said this, where your treasures, there your heart will be. And where your heart is, that's where your treasures will be. Kellogg had big profits this last quarter. You know what? This is a true story. Based on the sale of two things, Pringles and Pop-Tarts. Yeah! I mean, it's a breakfast food that they put sprinkles on. And even the name sound like a party, right? Pringles and Pop-Tarts. Say, Pastor, well, I, I just eat salad. Get some Pringles and crumble them on your salad. Celebrate. Kellogg's celebrating. They had a great third quarter, second quarter, based on the sales of Pringles and Pop-Tarts. 
a breakfast food with sprinkles. Come on. Seriously, celebrate. God's celebrations definitely reveal what he values. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Dude back here still smiling, aren't you, bro? Right? As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will God rejoice over you. God's celebrations definitely reveal what he values. Go back to Leviticus 25. If I missed anybody, they come back to mine, he says. Don't let your hands hang limp. He will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 through 17. I know you don't feel like you val- you're valuable. I know you don't feel like you're anything. But God is doing flip-flops over you. Please don't let your hands hang limp. Our celebrations represent, demonstrate what we value. And thirdly, celebration restores perspective. And that's the passage then in Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things give thanks. With the balance, with the caveat that I read earlier from Foster's book, we never celebrate evil. We celebrate God. We celebrate his triumph over it. We we triumph the, the eventual return of all to Zion. Right? When we celebrate the good things around us are easier to see. This is why that candle that you've got is so important because you're going to be going through your Bible. You're going to be looking for a word from God because life's a mess and you're in trouble and your friends are in trouble and it doesn't look like there's any way out. And you're going to see that candle and you go, you know what? I just need to take a moment and celebrate the good things of God. I need to be disciplined with my mind. My thought wa- mind wants to do something else. My thought life wants to go to grief. My thought life wants to go to sorrow. My thought life wants to go to anger. I'm going to practice the spiritual discipline of celebration. You're going to stop hitting the snooze button on celebrate, and you're going to celebrate because you found that little candle in your Bible. Our celebrations remind us of what we have, and I will tell you this. I know in my own life, and many of you know this, our celebrations keep us from being imprisoned by our loss. They keep us from being imprisoned by what we don't have. They keep us being imprisoned by what somebody else has that we would like because it restores perspective. Our celebrations recharge us. They're God's antidote for sadness and depression. A merry heart, Proverbs 17, 22, many of you have it memorized. A merry heart is like a what? A medicine. Joy and strength, strength and joy, they go together. And Richard Foster, it's in the book, but I've seen him say, because I've, I've watched him speak a lot on, on YouTube when I decided to do this sermon series. He would smile when he would remind in his talks It's an occupational hazard of devout folk to become stuffy bores. Celebrations keep us from taking ourselves and our causes too seriously. When I read that, I thought about communion. No offense to how you did communion today. No offense. But it was sure quiet in here for people set free from sin. I examined myself. I'm good. I want to celebrate. So I thought, well, okay, I remember I typed this. So I smiled. And I even forgot to take the cup and the bread. I don't know, Cindy, did you know? I didn't even take the cup. I forgot. I, I was getting so excited to celebrate my forgiveness, I passed it on to Cindy. I didn't even have one. Cadence came to grab mine. He goes, Poppy, I was too busy celebrating, honey. These are really two important cele- illustrations, and we're moving to the end. C.S. Lewis's autobiography, it's a very short, it's a partial autobiography, Surprised by Joy is the title of it. I did not know this until Monday or Tuesday this week. I thought, I'm going to go back and just scan that again a little bit and see if there's something there. I'm talking about celebration and joy. Maybe C.S. Lewis has something to say. He has something to say about everything, right? You know where he got the title, Surprised by Joy? From a poem by William Wordsworth titled, Surprised by Joy, Impatient as the Wind. I did not know that. This was a poem that Wordsworth wrote about the death of his daughter. And and what the poem describes, he would go back to this familiar place of loss. 
And those of you that have been through profound loss, you know that you can grieve to a point. There's a grieving that is, brings to wholeness, right? There's, there's a grieving that's part of the process of healing, correct? But then many of you also know there is this place of grieving that is a precipice, that if you actually went any further, it, it, it moves you closer to insanity than sanity. You know that grief? And Wordsworth would say this, I don't have my daughter, but at least I have my grief. And he knew that this grief very familiar to him, was a place he could go, that's all he had, and so that's the place that he went. And one day, take a look, one day, and it's in the poem, one day Woodsworth said he found love, faithful love. And C.S. Lewis called those interjections. Remember we said sometimes when you can't celebrate, God brings a celebration to you against his own will. God brought celebration to him, love, faithful love. The great surprise of joy was that it swallowed the grief that had become so habitually destructive. And then in your bulletin, I expanded a little bit more, but a rabbi was asked, how in the world did your people recover after the Holocaust? How did you come out of those camps, six million or more have died, and you come back, and you're, you pick up your lives where you left off, and they did, didn't they? They still had vision. It was those who came out of the camps are the ones that resettled Israel and have a nation there today. He said, well, we kept the feasts. In the camps, we kept the feasts. And he talked about it, and he expanded it a lot. He talked about the day before some would go into the ovens, they celebrated Passover. As they were watching others go to the ovens, they were celebrating Yom Kippur. You know what the rabbi said? We're talking about this perspective that our celebrating brings to us. God scheduled our joy into our calendar. God, so God in, in, you know, the Jewish calendar has all these feasts. It, year round feasts, year rounds to celebrate. Mom and dad doesn't feel like celebrating, but the kids can hardly wait for, for tabernacles. They get to live in a tent. Daddy, our neighbors had a bigger tent than I, we did last year. What's ours going to look like this year? I mean, and mom and dad don't want to celebrate, but it's scheduled in. And the rabbi said, that's how we recovered. Now, I've already scared a whole bunch of you because some of you saw the announcement on Facebook. But how can we say yes to this sermon? How, how can we put this to life? Well, we can celebrate. I'm looking at the sermon to life now at the very bottom, Psalm 71, 23. You've rescued me. Blow the shofar, year of jubilee. It's the year of Yobel, the ram's horn. You have rescued me. I will celebrate and shout, singing praises to you with all my heart. God is worthy of our celebration, praising, shouting, partying, and happy dance. Now, I'm going to give you an invitation this morning not to dance, okay? Don't worry. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, I want you to know this is the Jesus. This is the Savior. I'm sorry for any way I've ever portrayed it. I'm sorry for every other Christian ever portrayed Jesus this way, but we were wrong. This is the Jesus whose birth was announced as good news. This is the Jesus who inaugurated his sermon. His first sermon, my first sermon was the art of keeping off dead in street, streets. I preached the entire book of Ecclesiastes in one sermon. It was incredible, and I know you can believe I did that. His first one was to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and it sounds like he sat down. The shortest and the best sermon ever heard. I want to I give you that Savior. I want you to give... I want you to consider this Savior whose salvation that he offers was marked by celebration, his first miracle, turning water into wine. Now, this song we're going to play that we're going to go home with is a song that Mercy Me's kids hated when they saw it. I mean, you know the song Happy Dance. Anybody? Raise your hand if you don't. Okay, I'm glad you don't because you're going to just, it's going to irritate you or you're going to love it or something in between, but you're going to leave church different than you came in, I promise you. So when, when their kids saw, and th now this is Bart, who did I Can Only Imagine, all right? How many have seen the movie oh, I Can Only Imagine? You've got to see that. 
So this is the same dude, okay, whose dad was abusive and got saved just before he died, and that's why he wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine. And, the, and, and they intentionally in this video actually close out, introduce this song with the last line from I Can Only Imagine, because he's trying to show some irony here, all right? And when their kids saw this video, they go, Dad, we go to school. We have friends. Because it just makes them look like a bunch of old dorks. And it's awesome. It's just awesome. It's you with your grandkids. And your kids are going, oh, grandpa, oh, grandma. But now, Bart, I've seen, we've seen, I've seen him do it three times in concert. And now every time, every time they get into the, the family van, guess what song the kids want them to play? Happy Dance. So if you're not a believer this morning, we're sorry that we don't celebrate often enough because we need to. We have really good reason to be happy no matter what's going on around us. Even if everything else is falling apart, it's like Steve's sermon, Job worshiped. That's perspective taking. So if you want to give your heart to Jesus, you make sure you let us know. And some of you are not going to know how to leave now, okay? I get that. So I'm just going to close in prayer. You can run out if you don't want to see it. If you want to watch it, watch it. If you want to have fun, if you want to tap your feet. I don't know how to finish this. I just want you to know they're celebrating Jesus. And we got to get, we, we just have to <laughs> stop taking ourselves so seriously and take Jesus really, 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 really serious, okay? Father God, thank you for this. Lord, the spiritual practice of celebration. Help us to bring celebration back into the Christian experience. God, I know it'll change everything. I know it will. I know it will. Because many here could say that. And so, Lord, we, we, we just offer those who don't know you to celebrating Jesus to their broken, broken, lost hearts, God, that they might be found because you said they belong to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.